Hello there, Russell Goodman, Supply Chain Brain, Senior Editor here, welcoming you to our presentation today. It's titled, Safeguard Your Cargo in a Disrupted Supply Chain. You're living it, so you know today's global supply chain faces a new wave of destabilization, marked by a freight recession and historically low rates. Uncertainty is compounded by the persistent threat of global conflict. And as if that isn't bad enough, throw in an imminent surge in nearshoring and upsurge in cross-border freight movement, market upheavals, and bankruptcies of small and large carriers and brokers. Well, it's hardly a pretty picture because all of this hurts profit margins and results in toxicity throughout the supply chain. Well, fortunately, there is a disinfectant for it all. Real-time item-level shipment visibility. Well, today we're going to delve into the ripple effect of supply chain destabilization, how it magnifies risk in your day-to-day -day freight operations. We'll show that adopting the right visibility technology will help you stay ahead of the curve and effectively Minimize risks by providing you continuous knowledge of your cargo's exact location and condition. The takeaways? Well, how about this? Understanding the comprehensive scope of increased risk in a destabilized supply chain market, ranging from cargo theft and cross-border security concerns to questionable cost-cutting measures employed by brokers and carriers. The importance of not only diversifying your carrier network, but also holding them accountable for their performance. And how real-time shipment visibility can ensure business continuity and empower you to measure, monitor, and mitigate risk effectively. Well, to illustrate all of this for us today, Richie Daigle, Enterprise Account Executive at TIE. Now, with extensive experience in the transportation and supply chain data visibility space, from podcast host to blog writer to all-around industry resource, Richie brings innumerable benefits to Tive. Prior to Tive, however, Richie was the Sonar Enterprise Account Executive at Freightwaves, where he was, by the way, the only account executive to meet quota two years in a row. Also with us today, Kevin Hill owner of Brush Pass Research, a sales and marketing research firm, firm that helps companies sell to freight brokerages across North America. Now, Kevin has more than 10 years in the freight industry, both as a sales executive and as a media producer. He also hosts Put That Coffee Down, a freight sales show on Freightwaves TV. Well, previously, Kevin founded Carrier Lists, a carrier sourcing platform that was acquired by Highway in 2022. A truly valuable presentation is just a hit. But before we get underway, a word, just a word about the Q&A session that's going to follow the presentation. You participate by filling in the box at the bottom of your screen with your question. Our experts will address as many as possible before we sign off. Any questions still pending at the close of the show, they will get to offline. All right, now to our presentation and to Richie Daigle of Tive and Kevin Hill of Brush Pass Research. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks, Russell. I really appreciate the intro there and excited about this conversation. Um, I, I think to properly understand where we are currently in the, the current situation that we're facing, uh, the current you know, freight recession that we're all seeing, it's good to understand what led us to this, to this place. How do we get here? Um, just a few years ago, we were speaking about very different types of problems, right? Where the market was quite the opposite of what it, what it is today. Uh, there were bottlenecks everywhere. There were um, ships that were piling up off the off the coast of Los Angeles and all around the world. Um, there wasn't enough capacity for the demand of freight that was that was out there, and people weren't spending money on on Disney World and 
and going to, out to the movies and bars, they were buying anything and everything online and doing home improvement projects and all kinds of things. And it led to this huge uh, pileup. Um, and there were a lot of problems that came from that. You know, ETAs were out the window. Um, you know, we, we, we found all kinds of, of issues and we were solving for all kinds of issues. And now the market has flipped. Right. So now it's quite the opposite. Everyone is loaded up uh, with all the stuff that they need. They're back to traveling, going to movies, going out to the restaurants, and there's just not as much stuff moving around. Uh, meanwhile, the, the market has loaded up with all the capacity, you know, with the, the thought that the volumes that we saw a few years ago might be here to stay. Uh, and, and it's not the case. And that's provided kind of a perfect storm. Um, what we're seeing now where and that's driven driven volumes down and and you know led us to the the issues that we're facing now and i think kevin i want to get your thoughts on this but you know while while certainly there's relief from the problems that we saw two years ago there's not full-on relief is, is my take it's um there is no such thing as utopia in freight <laughs> there's no such thing as a panacea in freight there's no such thing as freight without problems. You know, the, the problems just change with the market is, is my take on things. And um, we're certainly seeing that here today. You're exactly right, Richie. Life and freight are both the same. It's always problems. Uh, you know, you're always having problems. You can choose your own problems in, in a lot of respect. And, that, and that's what you have to do in freight is to is to do that. Choose your own problems. We have a whole set of other problems. And, and you said there, there's no uh, utopia. And it's really like a pendulum uh, that overcorrects, you know, that it doesn't really hit the middle all that much. It's either you're overshooting on the upside, overshooting on the downside as well. And that's what you find. And that's what we find here in the freight recession. We're overshooting on the, the, the top side where um, a lot of things could be swept under the rug because you're having record years, right? We'll worry about it later. Uh, now with razor thin margin overcapacity out there, uh, it becomes not cost of doing business. It becomes a real issue and put under the magnifying glass. And that's what that's what we're seeing out there in a whole host of, of things. And certainly security, visibility, um, you know, uh, the deliverables to your, your customers. That's, uh, that's a big Big issue for everybody right now in, in logistics. Now, I feel like that pendulum is picking up uh, velocity, right? I feel like it's it's going faster and maybe further from side to side, right? And, and where in the factors leading to that are, you know, you have the Amazon Prime effect where everybody wants everything now. Um, and that certainly puts a lot of strain on things. Uh, and then also there's the fear of, oh my goodness, I don't want to go through what we experienced in the pandemic again, right? And so there's various factors. Um, and then you have global factors such as nearshoring, um, potential economic uncertainty. I think all of these are making those pendulum swings a little faster, a little closer, and a little further to the extremes. And, and that's not a not a comfortable situation to be in. Yeah, the, you know, we take both these bullet points, uh, inflation, economic recession, we're in a high interest rate environment that we haven't seen in a couple decades. Uh, so there's a lot of managers out there, a lot of companies who haven't had to navigate these waters. So there's a lot of unknowns in, in that respect. And then nearshoring and reshoring, right? Um, it, it's something that is a long process. It's going to take a long process that, that to play out. So we can talk about it every single day. It doesn't mean that we we speed up the process any because we are taking uh, supply chains out of certain countries and putting them in, in others. And uh, you have to build uh, factories, manufacturing plants, distribution centers. You have to have um, also the labor force trained up, and then you have to have the supply chain. You have to have those transport networks um, in place, and that takes uh, decades to do, but that is a whole new world for, for everyone as well. You had to rush to, to Southeast Asia back uh, 30, 30 years ago. Uh, those were, were, you know, navigating those waters was difficult. Uh, coming back to, to nearshoring and reshoring uh, is going to be a lot of, unknown unknowns out there and it's 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 rough seas no matter how you look at it for sure for sure and like you think about 
kind of the macro, you know, like I feel like what we're talking about right now is kind of at a high level, like pretty macro in nature and that here's some of the big heavy winds that are blowing in the marketplace and the big swing of the pendulum. But when you think about how this is impacting things in a day-to-day, um, you know, manner, like what's happening in the real world at a micro level, trucking companies are not, are, are they're having a hard time. Like their, their margins are thin right now. The rates, and there's so much capacity on the road. The rates are, on the floor so now you know what you know loads and runs that could have been making big money a few years ago now these companies are barely barely over breaking even and meanwhile you got to put food on the table you got to make ends meet and i feel like that drives people to be more creative in their income streams (laughs) when you talk about diversifying your portfolio uh when you think about that uh you know how do you do that when you're a small carrier you get creative with how you can make money and some of that may not be um, legal, you know, just to put it out there. Uh, And and so that's leading to, you know, we've seen this massive spike, 600% in in cargo theft. Uh, uh, You're you're seeing more strategic cargo theft, you know, uh, apart from just stealing a trailer or emptying a trailer, People are rerouting truckers, you know, calling truckers and posing as the shipper to to tell them to go to a different place. We're seeing a lot of fake MCs. You know, you're seeing companies like Highway, what they're doing with sorting out, you know, MC numbers and bad actors and double brokering. Um, and we're certainly seeing a lot of kind of nefarious consolidation or transloading as well, where there's extra space in the back of a truck. And, uh, you know, a trucker may decide to fill that with an LTL load in the middle. Um, you know, this type of activity and behavior is, I don't know if I can back this up with data, but I'm sure that it's, that it's not far off from an all time high. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the, the core of the problems that we're facing today. Whereas, you know, two years ago, it was more ETAs. Where's my stuff? Why is it late I'm getting him with all these fees? Can't get product quickly enough. The shelves are empty, et cetera. Now it's, why is all of our stuff going missing? <laughs> Where can I find it? I, you're exactly right. You know, you take two years ago and uh, theft was, I, I go back to the cost of doing business. It was, uh, you're trying to get as much capacity. There's a surge in load volumes. doesn't matter. We'll sort it out in the end. We're having a record quarter. Uh, it doesn't matter if, if something gets stolen. I won't say it doesn't matter, right? But the urgency isn't there like it is today where each of these thefts, each of these incidences are looked through under the magnifying glass. It's uh, under the microscope um, because when times are leaner, you start realizing kind of some of your uh, inefficiencies, you know, some of your, your issues, and you, you worry about that. And again, I don't know if, if, if cargo theft, if double brokering, if, if all the frauds, fraudulent activity out there, uh, I don't have any data to, 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 to say it's X more, uh, but it certainly feels that way. And what I will say is being talked about a whole lot more now than, than really it ever was. And I think some of those activities and some of those players, um, those bad actors, uh, they've kind of morphed and changed into more organized, um, kind of, kind of more organized crime. And um, that's, that's something that I hear about uh, from my conversations with 3PLs um, all, all the time is, is this feeling and the, this organization that um, theft and, and these rings of, of, of companies and individuals are, are doing so. It is. I mean, we're in a lean time. It means that everything that that does go wrong is is magnified, and um, solutions to look for. Yeah, it's, it, I think about almost like a boxing match, right? Like the the it's almost like taking body shots early in the match, right? Like and mm-hmm. when you're fresh and you're full of energy, you know, you're you're George Foreman versus Muhammad Ali, like back in the day, and you know, you you can just maybe that's the that's the wrong that's the wrong analogy right because it's, it's the body shots that start wearing on you right the ones that yeah. land you can kind of absorb them you know when your profits are through the roof but now as consumer behavior has come crashing back down to normality if you will or pre-pandemic normality like 
you don't have the big massive influxes of cash and sales to offset the pain points. Those pain points become much more acute, you know, and, and, and now you, what do you do? And at the same time, it seems like theft is on the rise at the same time. So those, those body shots are getting to be a, a little bit more severe. It, it is. And I, I go back to it's warm. Oh, sorry. I, I go back to, to Warren Buffett's uh, famous quote. Um, you, you never know who's swimming naked until the tide goes out. Um, so when times are great, you can cover up a lot of things. You know, the, the water, the, the high tides in, no one sees uh, anything. But when the tide goes out, um, you realize that you do have you do have these issues. And now is the time to take action against them. And it's it's, you know, I think with rates being a lot lower, you know, uh, uh, shippers are should be you know likely under budget, right? Like, okay, we're not facing these insane rates that we saw a few years ago, where our budgets were just completely shot. Granted, to your point, we could cover it up with all the increase in revenue, but uh, now the revenue is back to normal. We're under budget, but at the same time we're having problems. Like it's not perfect. There are, there are still big issues and, and um, like the amount, the dollar figures that some of these companies are reporting that it's being stolen are, are, are just outrageous, you know? And and so there, there's gotta be some sort of way to be better in both environments, right? Like there's no panacea. There's no way to be perfect. We can't get rid of all the problems. Um, Anybody that says we can, no, <laughs> like, like I, I don't, I don't think there is such thing as a problem-free environment in this market. But I think that we can be better prepared. I, I, it's like being in a boxing ring, boxing ring, right? Like you can't, can't be in a boxing match and not get punched. Um, there's going to be punches. There's going to be risk. Uh, but there's a difference between getting blindsided and being punched in the face and you never saw it coming, versus seeing that punch coming and being able to roll with it and take it and minimize the effect or minimize the impact and rebound quickly. Um, and I, I think that's where doing some smart things, you know, to, to, to build some resiliency can play a big role, you know, whether it's diversifying carrier networks so that you're not completely reliant on one person or one company, um, to having good data to benchmark carriers' performance, not only on tender acceptance and on-time delivery, but how are they handling freight? And then also maintaining good visibility of your shipments while they're in transit. Um, you, know, you need to know what's going on with your freight while it's being moved today more than ever before. Uh, and, and I think it's good to take these things into consideration and um, understanding that you know you're your overall solution or your overall security solution, your visibility solution, whatever it may be, is only as strong as its weakest link. And and understanding the links in the chain that are allowing you to move freight uh, as effectively and efficiently as possible is is crucial to to making sure things go as smoothly as they can. Yeah, and, and it's not about wholesale changes in, in a lot of respects, right? It's those incremental improvements. Uh, there, there's improvements that take oftentimes the least amount of effort to, that give you the, the, the biggest results. And protecting yourself uh, and these three bullet points are, are, are great for, for that, right? To diversifying your portfolio of carriers, so your, your vendors, and, um, and accountability and also visibility. Though there's those things that you can do today, you start making those incremental improvements that is going to protect yourself, which is all about resilience, right? Flexibility, resiliency, and the supply chain it is really about protecting yourself against the highs, the, the problems that, that come with the highs and the problems that come with the lows, right? The other two, two sets of, at least they're, they're looked upon in two different um, looking glasses, right? Though those, those problems, sometimes the same problem, it's just the, your different perspective on the importance of that. But, you know, having that diversification, have that resiliency, having that, uh, the, those, those together, you know, it just builds that robustness of a supply chain that, um, what, what they call anti-fragility, right? You don't want a fragile supply chain. You don't want a fragile transportation network. Um, I think it was Nassim Taleb in the Battle of Black Swan, right? You want that anti-fragility. And that's, that's important, especially in times like this. 
For sure. And and awareness comes with that too, right? Like you have yes. to increase your awareness. Like what is your shipment awareness? Uh, you know, do you have systems in place and technologies in place that alert you when something unexpected happens? You know, the, the earlier and the quicker you can find out about an unexpected event, whether it's a theft, whether it's um, something that's being rerouted, whether it's an impact, um, whatever the situation may be, the quicker you're going to be able to respond immediately and, and effectively, right? You don't want to learn about a problem eight hours after it occurred or six hours after it occurred. Um, if you can find out about it that moment, flexibility and speed to a resolution, you know, greatly increases and uh, better outcomes are on the way. Yeah, in, in, in business, it's all about velocity. Um, whether you're in sales, it's that communication velocity. Uh, communication velocity transfers very well into the supply chain operationally. You, you set or receive that. You, you, you don't want that to, you know, six, eight hours, maybe six, eight days sometimes um, after an incident or occurs, you don't want to find out about it. It's about velocity and building those tools uh, in your network, uh, for your network that increases that velocity, that velocity of reporting, that velocity of, of knowing what's happening. And visibility has, has a lot to do with that. It's, it's kind of that, that entry point, right? You have to know what's happening uh, before you can take steps to, uh, to, to, to fix things, to address things, to, uh, to, to pick up the phone and, and, and be a high velocity uh, vendor to your customers as well. All right, gentlemen. All right. Well, quite aside from that uh, memorable quote from uh, Warren Buffett, uh, one of the notes that I took was something that uh, Richie said, that uh, there is no such thing as a problem-free environment. Well, that's a sobering view, but certainly a truthful one. And you guys just gave us some terrific information about how we can prepare for that sort of thing. The resiliency that we need to build in to our supply chains. Well, the questions are coming in now from the um, from our audience, and I urge the audience to continue sending in your questions. But before we get into those questions, I want for us, uh, Richie and Kevin, myself, to sort of drill down just a little bit deeper into the material here. And uh, moderator's prerogative, I get to ask the questions. Um, the questions I drafted, I sort of had one or the other of you in mind, but I, I welcome each of you to answer them. Nevertheless, I want to start with Kevin uh, initially. Kevin, um, in your view, how do the biggest risk factors in today's supply chain compare to what we were worried about a few years ago in the height of the pandemic? What would you say? I mean, I would say that, oh, thanks, Russell. Um, I, I would say that some of it is about the, the double brokering and, and fraud, you know, that that is really, that is really an issue right now. And also, also you know, the, the robustness of, of supply chains. I, I think that's, that's, that's a big issue right now is, is exactly how to go about doing it. I think during the, the pandemic, there's a lot of uh, lip service to it. Um, a lot of people trying to sort it out in real time, but but now that that real time is over and we have the 2020 hindsight is that no one wants to experience that again. No one wants to go through that confusion and that chaos once again. So at least for now, everyone is being proactive in and really setting up supply chains and part of that's nearshoring, part of that's better security, um, more visibility to protect them against something that that chaos happening again. So I think that's an important thing. Rich, I have a question for you, but first of all, do you have a, a view to what uh, Kevin just uh, talked about? I think the one thing I'll say is that it's it's possible to, to feel contradictory things at the same time. And I, I feel like uh, a lot of people are still relieved that the, the problems of two years ago have kind of dissolved at the same time they're feeling the pressure and the anxiety and the stress of the problems they're facing today. 
Uh, and so what, which one carries more weight? I don't know. It probably varies from person to person, but I think that it's possible to, to feel both of those things kind of simultaneously or experience them both, both from day to day. Um, that'd just be my, my one thought there. Good thought though. Good thought. Richie, let me, uh, let me just stick with you for just a moment here. Um, tell us why should shippers be concerned about low rates in a freight recession some of them might think that's counterintuitive i mean wouldn't a soft market benefit them well what what do you say what are you telling me yeah you you, you think about it it's too good to be true right and so when uh yeah the uh, you know rates go down and certainly it helps things in the near term but you see all these other problems crop up right and depending on what the what type of cargo is being moved if there are things that are being put in the back of that truck that could be giving off some sort of off-gassing that is problematic for the freight that you're moving, you have no visibility to that. That's happening. The cargo that you're moving is being damaged while it's in transit, and you have no idea that this is occurring. Um, that's a big, scary thing to have in the back of your mind as a shipper. Um, and then also theft in general, uh, being, you know, going up higher and higher and higher people in, L in the LTL space, you know, there's a sign off for a certain number of pallets, but in, in reality, one few, there's one pallet missing. Um, it could be a, a whole truckload of cargo. Uh, we have a, a customer that, um, that we, our light sensor on the device caught a uh, light alert, a spike of light that was happening. And we caught a theft in progress where they were emptying out an entire trailer of for over $400,000 worth of product. Um, that sort of stuff is happening way more frequently than people realize. And um, certainly in, in you know, companies that are still working off the of JIT, that's, uh, that can be super problematic. Um, so I think theft is, is a very real thing and it's becoming more of a thing to be concerned about as rates are going down lower and lower and lower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kevin? Any thoughts uh, that you uh, on that uh, topic? Yeah, you know, Rishi summed it up uh, pr pretty nicely. Um, but but yeah, the the there are these these issues that well, when you talk about low freight, and, you know, low rate freight in, in environment, that means sales are down for the shippers, right? And you know, your your cheapest rate or your in a cheaper environment, these problems crop up of of, of more theft more issues, more cutting corners, because you have razor thin margins in trucking. So people are cutting corners, which means more damaged goods, right? Not even fraud, but more damaged goods, uh, things that aren't really kosher. Well, now you've anticipated my next question, uh, uh, Kevin, and that is to talk more about cost cutting, corner cutting that, uh, that we see carriers doing and how that impacts shippers so if you would let's let's drill down i want to ask both of you to address that but let's drill down in into that just how difficult or how much of a problem is that for shippers today what do you say it's a huge problem because as you said you know razor thin margins uh, a lot of carriers are just going to be unprofitable during the cycle and hopefully they have enough cash uh, available to to make it through um, because it's a boom bust cycle as we, we see in trucking but that brings on that, that corner cutting, right? Whenever you can cut out costs as a carrier, you're going to do that. And oftentimes that is a detriment to your service. And part of that service, you know, certainly perishables. I think Richie probably has some probably concrete examples for, for, for this that are, are going to be good. Um, but, you know, it's, just take perishables, take security, take uh, all sorts of factors, uh, you know, hiring the right people. And you just mix all those together. And what you have is a lot of opportunities for things to go wrong and, and go wrong, not just because of normal accidents, um, but be because of that, that cutting corner type of, of, of mentality that a lot of carriers have to operate. I won't say have to operate with, but naturally operate with um, whenever you're losing money or, or breaking even during the cycle. Richard, this is clearly a very, very important area there. So I want to get your thoughts on this as well. Corner cutting, cost cutting, talk to us about just what the, the impact of that is, the negative impact that is on shippers. What do you say? 
Yeah, you know, uh, we have a 24-7 monitoring team here at Tive, and, and I've been talking with the leader of that team about some of the trends that they've been seeing. Uh, I, I, I probably ask him this question every week, like, what are you seeing? What's going on? What is your, What are you catching? Uh, and then also in conversation with customers, both on the shipper side and the broker side, about what they're experiencing. Uh, I spoke with a broker who um, said that it was a carrier they've worked with for years uh, for for reefer freight, and they caught them setting their reefer unit. Uh, it, it should be on continuous, and they were moving it to automatic. Or there's been instances where they've turned it off entirely. Why would a trucker do that? Well, they're using less gas. They're saving fuel. I mean, this is where we're at. Their, their ability to say, you know what? There's enough insulation back there. No one will know about it. It's going to be fine. It's going to show up cold. I can you know, change this setting. I can turn it off altogether while I'm sitting here in this lot. And I'm going to save a little bit of fuel and save a little bit of money. Like this, These are the types of justifications um, and, and things that are happening. And you know, in the trucker's defense, they're probably not aware of the damage that that can do, uh, mm -hmm. especially if it's, you know, depending on the sensitivity of the freight. Same thing if there's, uh, you know, I spoke, I was on a call with a broker and they uh, got a light alert on their phone while we were having a conversation. And they said, oh my goodness, like I just bought this trucker lunch. I'm paying him dedicated money. It's a half truckload. I'm paying him dedicated full truckload money. I just bought him lunch two hours ago, and now I see that he's stopped, and there's a light alert, and the trailer's open. He's loading, he's filling up the other half of that truck to make more money, even though I'm paying him over market, I'm paying him dedicated money, and he's still feeling compelled to go try to find extra money, uh, you know, uh, during that load. These are all big concerns, whether you're a broker or a shipper. Um, and we're not even getting into outright theft yet, which is also on the rise, and so. I think the market being what it is, um, yeah, you just, you have to know that these things are happening. And if you, it, it's kind of like cockroaches in your kitchen, right? Like if you find one instance, one of these instances that are happening in your network, it's like seeing one cockroach in your kitchen, you know, and then you call the pest guy and he says, Hey, I hate to tell you this, but you got about 20,000 cockroaches living in your cabinets and mm -hmm. Now you have that awareness and that's an uncomfortable feeling, but at least, you know, and you can go about fixing it. I think it's kind of the same thing um, here uh, in, in that when you see one of these examples take place, it's probably happening in your network more than you want to realize or more than you're comfortable with. Well, thanks for that Stephen King nightmare scenario, 20,000 <laughs> cockroaches in my kitchen. Kevin, I know that you are looking at this at uh, Brush Pass. Uh, you're looking at nearshoring, the surge in nearshoring. You're looking at cross-border movement and just what risk they impose for uh, for folks. So walk us through that. What's your view? What's going on there? You know, there, there's there, there's risks to, to reshoring, nearshoring. Uh, you take financial risks. But, but if we talk about transportation risk, you you're operating in a whole new political structure, uh, whole, oftentimes a whole different culture itself, uh, a whole different physical terrain. Uh, so th there's a lot to take into account um, for that. I, I know a lot of people are coming out of Southeast Asia. Uh, Mexico is booming right now. Uh, I talked to my friends down on the border and, you know, Loreto's at basically full capacity. They're building a couple of other bridges uh, down there, but uh, it's, it's gearing up, I would say, for a perfect storm of uh, of, of the whole gamut, uh, again, of, of theft and, and fraud and also that, that you know, that, that limited capacity environment that is almost like pandemic style. So I think if, if everyone rushes in at the same time on the near shoring, especially in Mexico, you're going to you're going to have a lot of uh, issues like we saw in the pandemic where you have just this surge of demand with very tight capacity. So certainly watching that number one. And, um, and, and part of that is that that is the, the security risk that, um, that, that, that the supply chains face whenever you're, you're moving across borders is that that political risk, that terrain risk, that um, fraudulent risk, and also the capacity risk. And that capacity risk, whenever there's tight capacity, there's usually bad decisions being made by, by shippers. 
Um, some of that is FOMO or fear of missing out. Some of that is cutting corners themselves. And we were talking about cutting corners uh, on the carrier side. Shippers are, are, are as guilty as, as carriers when it comes to cutting corners. And we saw a lot of cutting corners uh, during the pandemic. And we're seeing some cutting corners on that, on vetting, on making sure that all their systems are in place, uh, procedures, technology, to, to be able to to really maximize the, the efficiencies of, of that. Richard, you may have some views specifically on uh, what shippers are doing in terms of creating risk for themselves, but also in terms of the surge in nearshoring and cross-border movement and creating risk. What's your thought there? Any views? Well, I think anytime you're charging into newness, there's there's the unknown, unknown unknowns, right? There, there's the risk that you don't see that you have to experience or that may, uh, that may be seen or may not be seen or may not be on the radar. And, and one that I think some companies may recognize, but others may not. I'm not sure. But you have the combination of nearshoring along, and then you pour on top of that, you know, the ESG goals and wanting to be more sustainable and wanting to be more green. And a lot of times that means let's use, let's pull the intermodal lever more than the truckload lever so that we can, you know, go grab those credits, you know, because there's going to be less, um, you know, less, less emissions you know, per load and intermodal versus truckload. Uh, now there's tools out there that allow people to measure that. So now you can report on it. So it, so now you have nearshoring and, and more production in Mexico, and that allows for an inter, a cross-border intermodal move, um, which is everything sounds great there. You know, you're saving money, you're, you're saving uh, carbon, but now you have, you know, freight that sitting on the rails is, is, it makes it a big target. You know, I think bad actors are probably licking their chops a little bit, um, knowing that there's going to be more and more freight sitting on rail cars that are, you know, easy targets, so to speak. And so um, along with these changes and these moves as, as, you know, there's certainly benefits and that's why they're happening, but the risks need to be understood and guarded against um, at the same time. Uh, so I, I think those are considerations that, that should be taken into account. Just want to tell the audience that we're going to get to your questions in just a moment and continue sending them in, if you will. Thank you very much. Richie, uh, I was jotting down some notes uh, during the presentation. I think we can say there are three big, big threats. A down freight market, global recession, and cargo theft. That 600% uh, increase is just absolutely frightening. So the question I would put to you is this, what is visibility's role in addressing all of these three threats? What would you say? Well, all of these are three big punches coming from uh, the, the opposing boxer of the market that you're in the ring with. Um, visibility allows you to see these punches coming to you so that you can roll with them, try to dodge them if you can. Um, and, and, you know, interact with them in the best way possible. Certainly you don't want to catch all these punches out of the blue. They'll knock you out. And then you learn about them six hours later when you wake up, you know? So I think, uh, and then more specifically having that awareness, time awareness of where your freight is located and then what's going on with your freight. Uh, are there excursions and alerts that are happening in the temperature that could signal, that a carrier has moved their their reefer unit to automatic or turned it off, you know, altogether. Are there light alerts happening where there shouldn't be, signaling that you know, truck, you know, trailers or containers are being opened in places where they shouldn't be, whether for theft or consolidation, either one. Um, what's going on with the impact, especially in LTL space? How is your freight being handled? Uh, are there instances where it's being mishandled or dropped and to what degree? And is that consistent with damage for the freight that you're moving? Ha being aware of these things um, in the moment, in the moment they happen, the moment they occur is crucial. I mean, that allows you to adjust accordingly. Uh, it certainly helps with the claims process, but also if you need to arrange a reshipment, if you need to contact the driver to fix a scenario before it goes bad, um, there's a number of things that can be done, whether it's saving a shipment or or expediting the the fix, so to speak, um, all of which are very important. It allows you to to, uh, you know, not absorb the full brunt of these instances, but, you know, roll with the punches, so to speak. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but there must be something that we haven't touched on. Uh, some something that shippers can do, something else that they might uh, do to protect themselves against the unique risks that we've been dis uh, discussing here today. What would what would that be? Walk us through that. Yeah, you know, I think Richard was talk talking about visibility. Uh, you know, everything is visible. You're, you know, and I talk a lot about intel. You know, in, in my normal day to day, you know, we gather intel information. Uh, data and that is this important you know we we're talking about instance levels but the, the meta level as well to inform you know learn from your past right and that's what visibility gives you that the keys to visibility gives you the the intel to be able to to build plans and build systems and just build everything out really to avoid those problems in the past. So history doesn't repeat itself. And you take physical on the ground data, you take the, the intel that you can find uh, through uh, you know, great information that is out there kind of more on the, the 30,000 30, foot level. And you combine all of those uh, along with some great human intel that, that you get through the vetting process of your carriers and, and other transportation vendors and that's where real, really powerful decisions can be made, right? That's where you can adjust this. You can get into that incremental improvement because if you can do something today that improves performance by, you know, 5%, 10%, that, I, I think that's more valuable than, you know, huge changes, you know, talk about nearshoring, you know, moving manufacturing, things like that, that take years and take a ton of capital investment and it might get you, uh, you know, 50% improvement, but there's a lot of risk of that and there's a lot of time. But if you can do something today that improves by just marginally and you keep doing that day by day, each and every day, uh, you're going to improve tremendously over the course of, of a year. And it's usually pretty low risk uh, things that, that, that you can do. But it's all about visibility. It's about gathering that intel. It's about having powerful data and make good decisions. Richie, we're going to get to the uh, Q&A from the audience in just a moment. So very, very briefly, do you have anything to add to what Kevin just said about the visibility and its role in helping to address these unique supply chain risks? I love what Kevin's saying. It, it makes me think of, you know, this idea of being micro ambitious, you know, I, I, being ambitious in the very small short term, you know, it, and it's easy to get caught up in these grandiose plans of, if only we can do X, Y, Z thing, it'll fix all of our problems. And we get focused on some sort of concept of utopia. Uh, and, and that can be a dangerous mindset to take on versus, you know, the, the idea that the, the direction that you're moving as an organization is more important than the position that you are in as an organization, regardless of how good or, or, or how bad your position currently is. If you're moving in a positive direction and making those small incremental improvements, that is the goal. That's the ambition versus trying to obtain a certain status or a certain position that you that you create. Um, because you you never like it's an infinite game, right? Like you never reach a position like a, an actual position when you're just controlling your direction, but your direction keeps getting better and better and better. And which is in, you know, uh, bettering your overall position, right? Um, so I, I think that is key, you know, having that mindset of constant um, improvement and, and constant bettering is, is really important and visibility certainly you know, plays into that mindset. Well, all right, gentlemen, great, great stuff, a terrific drill down. I think quite frankly, that's where some real value lies in today's presentation. But the questions are now coming in. And again, I urge folks, continue sending your questions in. Any we don't get to, they will answer offline. Here's one. Either one of you can take uh, this question or both of you. Questioner says, a common thread here is protecting margins. But bringing on a real-time visibility tool must involve some upfront cost. I guess this is the money question. How do you prove the ROI? Great question. What do you say? Yeah, I think uh, you have to understand the nature of the problem and what the problem is costing you first and foremost, right? I, I think wrapping your head around and the, not not just the immediate 
But what are the downstream implications in terms of the true size of the problem from a financial standpoint? And then you can look at what the solution is going to cost and make sure that it's worth your while. Certainly, the technology is such today that there is a strong ROI for a lot of types of freight. Um, but to be honest, there are some you know solutions out there that may not be the best fit for certain types of freight. Um, and so you know you want to you want to have that frank conversation with doing the math of of, of uh, the financial size of the problem versus what the solution is, uh, you know that whatever technology that you want to onboard to lessen that and understand what that's going to be able to provide and, and run that math accordingly. But uh, yeah, God and the devil live in the details, right? So you want to you want to be pretty thoughtful with that math. Kevin, any thoughts? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, but ROI is always a, a a special special thing, isn't it? Right? Yeah. You, it's easier to to quantify all the direct costs, right? And and you build an ROI with that. But what we often ignore are all those hidden costs. Right, the, the the time that the, the current problem takes uh, from productivity of your current employers, uh, the limits on growth of your organization because of of these hidden costs. Right, um, certainly the loss of a customer, the loss of the opportunity to gain new customers, kind of goes back with growth. But the loss of customers, um, so there's a lot of hidden costs uh, in, in any supply chain that never really get painted a, a full picture because of the lack of intel, the lack of awareness of that. Um, but if you add in those hidden costs to an ROI, that's the best case scenario. Sometimes it's hard to quantify, um, but but the, they're always important to at least list out and just say, what if? What if we had full productivity, right? We're, we're not wasting 10% of our time chasing this around. What would we be doing with that 10% of our time? And if that includes bringing on new revenue or the opportunity to, to, uh, to, to be able to handle new revenue, then you add that into your ROI. So it, it can get a little bit abstract and, and complicated, but if you just think about those hidden costs, and try to build that into your ROI, that, that paints a much fuller picture of the, the benefits of implementing anything and visibility being more of those. So, so many good questions are just flowing in here. I like this one. Any particular industry that is experiencing a surge in cargo theft? And I guess the unasked part of that is, is this a problem just generally across the board? What do you say, gents? I think we're seeing that it is a problem across the board. Um, certainly, uh, types of freight that are easy to resell are big targets. So, you know, think about big name brands, whether it's apparel or jewelry or electronics, um, uh, you know, cell phones and sneakers and and, and things like this are, are huge targets because it's easy to turn around and resell these on eBay or, or Facebook Marketplace or whatever and offload and get rid of it and, and turn it turn cargo into cash is easy. But that being said, we're seeing we're seeing theft on a number of things. We're seeing food theft. Uh, we're seeing uh, light alerts where there's consolidation happening on virtually every type of freight and consolidation, meaning that, you know, companies are wanting to uh, put, more, you know, cover up or fill up the rest of a truck. We're seeing that in the pharma space. We're seeing that in food space. We're seeing that in industrials. Um, almost across the board, we're seeing a lot of companies, a lot, a lot of instances where truckers are are wanting to make that extra buck. So, um, yeah, there's kind of a, a long answer there, but it's a little bit of everything, but there, there's certainly more instances in certain areas than others. Let me just jump to another question because we're, we're definitely running out of time and we've got so many questions here. Can you offer any examples of specific anti-fragility measures that have effectively mitigated the impact of cargo security issues? Well, they want some specificity there. What do you say? Either one of you. I could take a shout out at Kevin. I feel like he might have something yeah. to say about anti-fragility, but um, as far as cargo security, you know, having a light sensor on an IoT device to know when and where, specifically when and where doors are opening, allows you to be aware of those events. And if that's happening at a place and a time where it shouldn't be, 
that allows you, that gives you that awareness where you can get the, the proper parties involved to try to stop a potential theft from happening. Um, so that's, you know, having that set up on, a, on an excursion or an exception or an alert basis frees up your time where you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to stare at a screen. You don't have to make a thousand check calls. You don't have to stress, but still you're going to be aware the moment that something happens. Uh, so that, that that gives you some resilience without having to uh, to constantly be stressed while something sensitive is in, in transit. Um, Kevin, do you have anything else there? Yeah, you know, you have your, your physical, you know, your, your vetting process, right? And having software and tools in place to, to verify that who you're dealing with is, is actually who you're dealing with kind of upstream from, from, from shipments and moment in, in, in motion. So I think having both tools, right? Those redundancies and, and anti-fragility is all about the redundancies. Uh, so having, having, a pretty strict system in place in, in each chain of, of custody uh, means that, you know, you have those redundancies in place. It means that it's going to be anti-fragile. One thing can break down, but something else is going to, to, to catch it along the way. All right, gentlemen, uh, here's another specific question. They want some statistics, if you can give it to them. The question says, or the audience member says, given Mexico is a top top nearshoring destination. Nevertheless, it is a high security concern country. So how is visibility help uh, helping to address the security concern? And then they say, do you have any statistics to share on that? Great question. And I, I wish I had some specific statistics that, that apply there. Um, but I will say what what we're seeing is companies that are like doing kind of a b testing right and, and and generating their own statistics based off of you know accurate and robust data for example if they're moving freight from from cross-border freight from you know mexico city to phoenix or, or wherever i'm just picking some random some random uh points here there may be a, a number of different routes that can be taken you know and so um, they may see various security concerns, light alerts and stopping, you know, you can set up geofences and see that trucks are stopping for longer than they should along certain routes um, than others. And they can start, you know, understanding which one, you know, which route is going to carry the, the, the least amount of risk. Um, so that's more of a strategic application for from a data standpoint. Um but I think that's that's a you know specific statistic that can be generated you know through these IoT devices. All right, gentlemen, we're we're just about out of time, so uh, I, I want to go to each of you now, starting with uh, Richie. I want to leave you. I want us to leave the audience with a great takeaway, something that they say, "Yes, I've got great information today, but I, this is the one thing I need to you know to be working on, thinking about, doing something about." So the question, Richie, is this. We know what challenged supply chains today. We know what's going on. We know what challenged them in the past. But because there's uncertainty, we never know what's going to happen tomorrow. So what should companies do to be more resilient and prepare for what comes next? What would you tell them? Yeah, I'll go back to what I said previously about, you know, the true strength of your visibility solution, the true strength of your security uh, the true strength of your systems is really only the weakest link and understanding the links in the chain uh, for your visibility, for your tech stack, for uh, your security and, and being able to identify where those weak links reside and addressing those accordingly uh, with technology or, or whatever it is to, to bring them up to speed. I think that's really important. And so, um, yeah, I think just understand that, you know, the your, your strength is you're only as strong as your weakest link. And the second thing is find out where your weak links lie and, and make some adjustments. Kevin, briefly, what is the takeaway that they really need to have? Yeah, it's all about those weak links. It's all about flexibility, you know, going through the pandemic, coming out of it being flexible, being able to take a surge in volume and then ride out uh, the, the the recession that that will follow, and you know, is that uh, the placing those redundancies into the system, creating something that is anti fragile, and that means looking at all those links in that supply chain, 
and examining that, like, like Richie said, um, making sure that you don't have any weak links. And if you do build redundancies around there, it's all about anti-fragility and having a robust uh, supply chain. And visibility is one of those keys. And knowing all the intel and all the data out there, getting your arms wrapped around it. All right. Great, great information. Great takeaway, I must say. Folks, everybody who's watching here today, I want you to know that uh, Tyve is going to continue to be in contact with you. Look at your screen very carefully right now. An upcoming special report, Cyber Scams and High Tech Heists, Securing Freight in the Age of Strategic Cargo Theft. You will want to read this, and it is upcoming. Subscribe to Supply Chain Brain, and it will be yours. All right. Be on the lookout for that. All right. Listen, I want to thank uh, Rich, Richie Daigle of Tive and Kevin Hill of Brush Pass Research today for sharing their time and their expertise with us. And again, if we didn't get to your questions, and I see there's still quite a few, they will be answering them offline. Well, thanks not only to them, but a big thanks to each and every one of you for attending today. Well, this concludes our presentation. So until next time, Russell Goodman. Supply Chain Brain saying, so long. <laughs>